report of the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 21, 2017. I invite you all to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Abby Baton. Uh, I then uh, invite you also to remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is to con consider tonight's agenda. Dr. Dance, are there any changes or additions to tonight's agenda? Uh, there are none. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda then as presented? So moved. moved. Second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Very good. The motion carries. The agenda is as prepared. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at regularly scheduled board meetings. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight. Angela Feeney. Pamela Shapiro, Three. Troy Truesgarden, Marion Moore, Five. Betty LeBron, Six. Kim LaVouche, Seven. Amy oh. Mitcherling, Yara Check. Christine Hagan. Very good, thank you. Our next item is pub public comment, and this is one of the opportunities for the board to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will ask the superintendent and his staff to respond. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board uh, and the system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask that you also observe the three-minute clock, which, which will let you know when your time is up. Um, I'll first invite the advisory and stakeholder groups uh, to speak, and our first speaker tonight is uh, from TABCO, and that's Abby Baton, our Pledge of Allegiance leader. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Springtime in the winter is a welcome respite. It looks very promising that our spring break will be a full-time break. We are all happy about that. I do worry that this kind of warm weather for winter, what will our spring and summer weather and what might it look like? For now, I'm just going to enjoy the springtime in February. The Grading and Reporting Steering Committee met last week and we really had some very good discussions surrounding the issues and the way forward with some of the problems we have seen with the rollout this year. Many of us felt we are moving in the right direction for some much needed changes for next year. If done correctly, these changes will help simplify an overly cumbersome process and will still allow for mastery grading to prevail. 
That said, we are optimistic but concerned that in the rush to do it all at once, we will again be faced with an overreaching top-down grading reporting model. We encourage real teacher and stakeholder group input via surveys and possibly focus groups. We feel not only that that should happen specifically for the grading and reporting guidelines, but also for the report card revamping. Teachers understand that not all ideas that they, are, that they put forth can or will be used in the final product, but they will know that they have been heard when the final product is easy to use, gives them the information they need to grade their students with fidelity, and helps ease some of the extra workload put on them with this year's grading and reporting rollout. We will remain vigilant as we continue through the process. We want to what is best for our students, and we know that if we can't manage it well, it won't be in our students' best interests. And on Saturday, March 4th, TABCO is holding our annual Read Across America event, which is what I just passed out to you, at the Towson Town Mall from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We would love to have you attend and serve as, a, as guest readers for our children, so just let me know if you could come, because we'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that's Leslie Weber. Ms. Weber. Good evening. I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Emory Young. PTA Council advocates for BCPS parents and students, so we feel it's crucial to discuss the findings of Johns Hopkins University's 2016-17 mid-year evaluation of STAT. Year three is the year student achievement begins to be assessed. The presentation includes test data, but the 90-page report doesn't. One must study both on the BCPS website and watch the video of the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting on live stream to get a fuller picture of what's going on. Dr. Stephen Ross from Hopkins characterized slight achievement gains in park and map scores in lighthouse and non-lighthouse schools, grades one to three, as not statistically significant. He noted that if one liked the idea of using technology, students didn't lose anything in terms of achievement, and that STAT didn't interfere with achievement. He predicted that achievement would remain low because schools have to struggle with implementation before they see increases in student achievement. He suggested seeing what happens next year. The Hopkins report noted that Lighthouse schools grades one to three, now in their third year of STAT, showed statistically insignificant growth in P21 skills, including using critical thinking to solve problems, and declines in student-initiated communication. Very little collaborative learning was observed. One third of elementary school students felt that device use adversely impacted their ability to interact with peers. When devices were used both for tests and homework, half of middle school students expressed a desire to spend less time on devices. The report suggested increasing opportunities for students to use devices in pairs or small groups to foster peer interaction. When students did work with others, they felt it was better for the group to use one device, since it reduced the chance of off-task off behavior. This might be an indication that the METP and MABE supported three to one device ratio should be considered. When asked at the meeting if BCPS was on the right track, JHU stated that a clear focus on professional development was needed to integrate technology for higher order learning. Dr. Ross reminded everyone that the devices do not inc increase achievement, high quality instruction does. Yet this has always been true. Well-trained teachers offering meaningful and engaging instruction improve student outcomes with or without technology. It was clear from the report that students valued their teachers and sought more engagement with them. As one student observed, you can't ask a computer questions, and when we're using our computers, we can't interrupt our teacher because she's busy working with other people. Children need human interaction with both peers and adults, not increased isolation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Our next speaker is from the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County, and that's Ms. Marin Bloom. Good evening, Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and the members of the Baltimore County Board of Education. My name is Lila Marenbloom, 
and I am the president of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. During the budget input session, I shared that the support staff has and continue to have concerns about Kronos, the program used to monitor our time. Since that time, ESPE conducted a survey and received an overwhelming response. We had a 70% response rate, or 702 responses. Now we look forward to sharing these results in detail with the Kronos Committee and addressing the concerns of the ESPs. Thank you for your time and efforts to ensure that a positive working condition exists for the support staff of Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council, and that's Tiffany Stith. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Tiffany Stimp, and um, along with Lily Lee, I chair the Northeast Education Advisory Committee. I'd like to speak to you this evening about overcrowding um, issues that we are experiencing in the Perry Hall community, specifically at Perry Hall Middle School. The school itself is a very good school. There's quality administrators, outstanding teachers, and a friendly support staff. However, our children, the students, are riding crowded buses. They're eating lunch during breakfast hours, approximately 10 o'clock a.m. in the morning, and they do not all have locker space and are navigating jam-packed hallways. Our students, more students will be coming from the eight feeder elementary schools, many of which are already overcrowded. Perry Hall Middle School is built for 1,643 students. As of February 14th, 2017, the current number of students attending is approximately 200 students above capacity. In less than two years, the number of students above capacity will double, such that the excess enrollment is roughly equivalent to the population of Seven Oaks Elementary School. The projections for Perry Hall Middle School enrollment, based on a student count's 2016 study, shows that the enrollment is going to climb to 2,075 in 2018. That's 126% capacity. We appreciate that money has been added to the budget for a study and increased funding for transportation has been given to Perry Hall Middle School. Um, so we thank Julie Hen and the rest of the board members for that. But this is only the first step in developing a plan. We truly need action and not just a short-term solution and we need assistance in addressing this overcrowding problem in the Perry Hall community and a more, comprehen more comprehensive solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, the public comment. The uh, first speaker is Angela Feely. Um, I'm Angie Feely. I'm from Kingsville Elementary School. Um, number one, I wanted to start off by saying <coughs> um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be a stakeholder last year and come here and um, have so many speeches about air conditioning. I feel like as a parent and as a stakeholder that I was definitely listened to, and so I definitely want to say thank you for that. The other thing I want to say is now I am trying to do something a little bit bigger. Perry Hall Middle School is very overcrowded. I have four children that will be going there. I myself went there 20 some years ago, and it was overcrowded then. So the amount of overcrowding is just continuing to mount. I do appreciate that you have put in the budget for looking at some redistricting and 
personally, I think that is the best case solution for right now, but it is a temporary solution. There was redistricting, I believe, in the early 90s. And so, again, here we are with a, a temporary solution where, yes, that was helpful then, but now we're at the point where there's just a, a city of trailers, and that's not really great for education. Uh, when I was at the meeting about two weeks ago, there was a woman who had an absolutely wonderful speech about exactly what her child goes through every day to come in, not have a locker, <clears throat> or having a small locker, and then not having time to get from one side of the building to the other to get their things before they have to go outside in a trailer, no matter what the uh, weather may be, and then being wet for the rest of the day. I think a lot of people who have children in elementary school just aren't at that point yet that they don't understand, and maybe not just those who are not in elementary <clears throat> not have kids in middle school, but adults. Like, you don't understand what it's like to have to spend your whole day in a crowded building trying to fight through to get just to your next class on time and then get into that class. And then what if you have a little bit of an issue? You have 30, 40 kids in that class, and you're trying to learn, and teachers are doing their absolute best and it's just very hard when you have that amount of kids and it doesn't seem to be getting any better it just seems to continually get continually getting worse so I, again I do appreciate the <clears throat> the redistricting but we also don't have really any information on the overcrowding study and how long is it going to take is it going to be 12 to 18 months to complete before we see anything actually come from it so I guess I'm asking you what more is going to be done in the long term. The amount of overcrowding, again, I've already said, is continuing to mount, and I don't see too much being done about that. So we'd love to make some changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Philly. Our next speaker is <coughs> Pamela Shapiro. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm here speaking specifically to Delaney High School. I'm going to say extemporaneously. My heart goes out to you guys at Perry Hall because that's the norm at Delaney. No lockers, missing hit heat, no air conditioning, no potable water, and, no, and that's been that way. I'm a 10-year parent there. It's been that way since my son started there 10 years ago, okay? And you can always tell the first-timers in the PTA, they raise their hand and say, why there's no air conditioning? Why is there no drinkable water? It's a type of thing where it's about time we did something for it. 10 years, 10 years, and my kids have six. I'm gonna say this for Baltimore County Schools. My older two children have gotten through and done wonderfully. The curriculum, excellent, teachers, outstanding. The principals <coughs> have dealt with the problems very well. But the physical plant is a disgrace. And it's been that way for 10 years. Now you guys are finally gonna do something and they're going to force down a renovation that's going to cost almost more than half as much as it would cost to tear down the old building and put a new building up. If you crunch your own numbers from Carver, you would see that. I'm just doing with whatever information I've gotten, and none of which I have seen has been really clear. There is no way on the budgeted money you have here you're going to be able to replumb, rewire, and renovate the high school to be large enough for the overpopulation postulated in 2020. You guys, I'm just gonna say this. I forgot my sign. You're gonna have to build a new building. Renovation won't do it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Thor Trigvison. Thor Trigvison. Good evening, board members. First of all, thanks to Julie Han and the board for approving the study and the increased funding for the transportation for Perry Hall area. What is missing, like um, Angie said, is timing when the study will start, when it will end, and when the board can act on the information from it. The study is great for the expected overcrowding of Perry Hall High, but it's too late for Perry Hall Middle. And let me tell you why. The overcrowding study will take 12 to 18 months to complete before we see any actionable items from it. By then, we're most likely in the 2019 school year with no solution in place. 
I'm sorry, but that is just not good enough. With a middle school that is already severely, severely overcrowded. The overcrowding problem in Perry Hall is nothing new. This has been an ongoing issue for years, and the board has done very little to remedy the situation. On February 8th, Mr. Kamenitz was quoted on WYPR saying that Perry Hall Middle is bursting at the seams. What an understatement. Let me get the board up to speed on the new enrollment study that was just released, um, adding more students to Perry Hall Middle in 2019, just two years from now. It will have 2,121 students attending. Let me repeat that, 2,121 students attending. That's 478 above maximum, equivalent to a whole elementary school. It's an increase of 270 students from today, more than doubling the current overcrowding. Where are you gonna put these additional students? In 10 new trailers? The halls are already overcrowded. There's no locker space. There are four lunch shifts in today with lunch and star lunches starting at 10 in the morning. There are 30 to 40 kids in some classrooms. Outdoor space looks like a trailer park. 2,100 students will call for a fifth lunch period. Is lunch gonna start at nine in the morning? This will be completely unacceptable to, to county staff, including BCPS, but this is supposed to be okay for teachers and children at Perry Hall Middle. The board cannot let Perry Hall become another trailer park. Temporary trailers are poor use of taxpayer funds for permanent problem. We need the recreational space for sports, not for temporary trailers. They cannot become a crutch for the board to lean on. Dr. Dance, you are ultimately responsible for the actions of the board. You are the leader of the board, and in my opinion, you have failed the children and parents in Perry Hall by your inability to act on the overcrowding data. We call on the board to act immediately on the overcrowding issue in Perry Hall, establish a task force, and provide temporary solutions such as redistricting until a more comprehensive solution such as a new school can be put in place. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to discuss policy 5140 and 5150. I want to start off with 5150 because that's focused on enrollment, and that's what a lot of people are talking about tonight. So I'll just start off with some, some innovative recommendations. We anticipate increasing enrollment, uh, especially uh, or perhaps Baltimore City residents migrating to Baltimore County and possible employees from Baltimore City uh, Public School System due to their bu budget cuts. With this enrollment trend, uh, we have to be innovative with our planning. For example, uh, based on my teaching experience, certain uh, programs available to students such as the CCBC uh, dual enrollment and the CTE program I noticed that there was a trend where some of my students would graduate early, like their junior year, because of those that particular program with CCPC, or they would be working their senior year. So basically that trend is, is letting you know if carried out appropriately across the board that uh, there would be, uh, the population would decrease in high schools if we make sure that the students are have their internships in um, working experience, as well as the um, advanced academic programs that would allow students to graduate early. So you see that trend. Um, with that said, then we would create or construct smaller high schools when, with the, recon, um, renov not the renovation, but you could build uh, smaller high schools and larger middle schools. In addition to that, is it possible to model the dual enrollment program with CCBC and have eighth grade students attend their community high schools for the CTE programs or the advanced academics? I mean, it's something that you may want to consider. Um, 
because that that would help with the the overcrowding. So, uh, say for example, maybe your business program at a middle school or any type of CTE program that you offer at a middle school is offered at their community high school. Then they could attend the high school that may have just been built, which would also help with the um, enrollment issue. And for 51.40, oh, we have nine seconds. I guess I, it's not meant for me to say it. Okay, so good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Betty Lebrun. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Mega dittos to all the Perry Hall parents who are complaining. I come uh, because of that, and I'm, I'm losing uh, money tonight to come and testify. I can't do this every month. <laughs> I work at a restaurant. Um, and as I said last month when I testified, I have extensive education experience. I, How, Howard County, from the 70s into the mid-90s, I retired. And then a lot of sub-teaching at St. Paul's Lower and, and uh, Liberty Christian in Randallstown. Uh, the overcrowding. Um, at my part-time um, job, uh, I've gotten to know a lot of the people. Perry Hall is a great area. Uh, it has stable neighborhoods, prosperous businesses, low crime rate, very bonded families and parents who are strongly involved with their children, and they work hard to pay our high taxes. And it's a very deserving group of citizens. And I was told by a group um, that a, a group of Perry Hall parents uh, came to your meeting two weeks ago, and I believe they're going to stay highly involved, and I hope they do. We just you, we have to keep pushing that, uh, keep being the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. Uh, the per Perry Hall people need to do this. I also hear that David Marks is working uh, to, to solve this problem. And I don't know if you've seen the copy of the East County Times newspaper. I got this, they're free. I got it at the Best Buffet in Dundalk. It's the February 16th, and it's right on the front. I left a copy for Ann Miller. Sorry she's not here tonight. But uh, you could borrow it from her. It's a very good article and talks about it. And the group um, talked about doing a study and so forth. Uh, 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 about the the uh, impact and so forth, could you? Uh, they talked about the consultants uh, taking 18 months. You've got to really speed it up. Get them on the get get them on the fast track. They talked about it. It might be five years before you make a um, a a. a, 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 a total solution. Do, do you realize how long one school year is to a child? It's a long, long time. I spoke to my manager's little daughter, who's in Perry Hall Middle, in the sixth grade. She said it's crowded in the halls. They have to push their way through to get through. And, and it's the same way in Perry Hall High, same thing. Uh, on the bus, three children had to sit on the floor and somebody in the article, and I think this was rather condescending, said, well, maybe they were on the wrong bus. Give me a break. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. The, the children in middle school, they know what bus they're supposed to take. So uh, Parkville, uh, and I understand Parkville and Pine Grove are under-enrolled, and I hear redistricting is a definite possibility. Thank you, Ms. LeBron. Our next speaker is Kim <coughs> Levish or Levush? Levish. Hello. Good evening. My name is Kim Levish, and I am the PTSA treasurer at Perry Hall Middle School. I want to start today with a thank you. Thank you for hearing us when we spoke here a few months back about our concern and need for another nurse at our school. As I understand it, phone calls started within a week of that meeting, and an assistant nurse has been hired. Also, thank you for hearing us when many in our community emailed Dr. Dance and attended the last meeting to share our concerns regarding a lack of funding within the upcoming budget to address the overcrowding issue in Perry Hall. I am grateful that the board voted unanimously to recommend $250,000 for a comprehensive middle and high school enrollment study and an additional $1 million in funding to increase contracted student transportation services. 
I'm also grateful that we are moving in the right direction. I realize that this is just a first step and making sure to plead our case with county executive contaminants is important for this to continue to move in the right direction. I understand there are a lot of things that need to be addressed in our Baltimore County schools and the budget cannot cover all of them. I also understand that when something is not in your face daily, it can move to the back burner and thus make the need for resolution seem less important. Therefore, our community plans to continue coming forward and emailing our situation to keep everyone updated on where we are and what we need. The Board of Education and County Executive need to take action in addressing the overcrowding before the situation becomes worse. We are past the point of being able to be proactive about the overcrowding situation, but we still have the opportunity to come up with a plan for the near future that shows appreciation to the outstanding administration and teachers at Perry Hall Middle School and help avoid the possibility of a serious situation due to the diminishing level of security that comes with overcrowding. It shouldn't take a serious accident to occur to understand and realize the situation is an important one. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Mitcherling. Hello, my name is Amy Mitcherling. As you can see, I'm also a Perry Hall Middle School parent. Um, I'm actually also a graduate of Perry Hall Middle School. I left there in 1989, and then I went on to Perry Hall High School and graduated from there in 93. I remember back when I was in middle school, Perry Hall Middle School, hearing we were the largest middle school in Baltimore County. Granted, I was 11, 12 years old. I don't have numbers, but you know, I'm pretty sure we were pretty large back then. My sister is five years behind me grade-wise, and by the time she got to Perry Hall Middle School, they had already redistricted to Pine Grove. <clears throat> she was still in the Perry Hall boundaries, but I know she was devastated. A lot of her friends who lived up seven courts were sent to Pine Grove. So that, you know, you did that back then, but then, look where we are now, we're still overcrowded. You build an addition at some point, you know, and we're still um, over capacity with the amount of students we had. Um, I did want to add, we are thankful for the nurse that you, the nursing support we asked for last time. So um, anyway, but I know last year we were out of lockers as kids were leaving our school and new students were entering our school. I remember Mr. Zink saying it was always a scramble, emailing the homeroom teachers, where are the lockers? I have a new student, this is the grade, how close can I get them to where they need to be? Um, he requested and was able to get new lockers to be installed over, in, over the summer. They were installed and I believe if we're not out of lockers again, we are close to it. And I know with being over 2,000 students in the next year or two, if we're out of lockers this year with 200 more students, we will definitely be out of lockers then. We're also out of gym lockers. There's a lot of students last year who there's not enough space in the gym locker room, so they store their phys ed uniforms, their tennis shoes, sweatsuits, whatever, in their hall locker, has to make an extra stop there, get their stuff, you know, to be ready for phys ed class. Um, you know, it's just a lot of things to think about. We had three trailers also added this year. Word on the street is we're potentially getting five trailers next year, so that'll bring us to eight trailers. When you add 200 more students, what's gonna happen in the years after that? We're going to have our own little trailer park. <laughs> it's gonna turn into a city. And then that means we lose the lower recreation field. One thing, I mean, I grew up playing sports with Perry Hall Rec Council. We used the fields at Perry Hall Middle School. Already with three trailers in the lower field, potentially five more coming, who knows how many more after that. That's less space that not only the, the teachers have, the phys ed, phys ed teachers have to use for class instruction, but the rec programs also lose those fields for softball, baseball, or whatever other sports um, they use there. So I just, I hope that, I, I'm grateful that the funding was added to the budget. I know our community is trying to, you know, very nicely encourage um, county executive cabinets to keep that in the budget when he goes through the final approval process. We know we're, we're almost there. I hope he's aware of everything and I hope he keeps it. Um, we just hope going forward that just a better solution comes, you know, that we're not in this situation 20 years from now. 20 years ago, there was redistricting, there was an addition built, well, what happened? It wasn't properly planned for. So I just hope, you know, 20 years from now, we're not. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Yara Sheikh.
Thank you, members of the Board of Education and Dr. Dance for this opportunity to speak. My name is Yara Sheikh, and I'm on the League of Women Voters Education Committee and the proud mother of four students in the Baltimore County Public School System. In addition, I'm one of the founders of Friends of Delaney High School, which currently has over 1,900 followers. As many of you know, I've been advocating for school construction dollars for over a decade. And tonight is no exception, but this time I'm asking for you to keep the money. I'm here today to discuss the recent bids except February 14th for the planned Delaney High School limited renovation from the current capital improvement plan submitted by Baltimore County Public Schools. You as a board will vote on this contract March 23rd. I ask that you not award this contract. As you know, the most recent renovations at Pikesville High School and Hereford High School, both of which are smaller than Delaney High School by over 800 students and 600 students, cost $50 million and $51 million respectively. The breakdown of cost was $308 per square foot for Pikesville High and $272 per square foot for Hereford High School. If the bids for Delaney High School approach a similar price tag as alluded to in the letter Orrester Shaw sent Dr. Uh, Scott Krugman, one of our Delaney High School advocates, and Mr. Shaw is the county executive's education liaison, the letter came out today, that puts our project at about $215 a square foot. This clear inequity of funding is generating significant concern within the Delaney community. We are almost double the size of those schools. Furthermore, half of the almost half of the money is being spent on air conditioning. This was not the case for Pikesville High or for Hereford High. In addition, this bid does not include site work needs cited in the feasibility study. It allows for only about 1 20th of the costs to be directly spent on educational enhancements. Compare this to the two two-story wings, science and math, constructed at Pikesville High School during their renovation. To be clear, Delaney High School opens in 2019 with this completed limited renovation with a remaining 47,000 square foot deficit of space for its original state-rated capacity. Also, we will have to come back to you in 2019 begging for a second systemic renovation for the 75,000 square foot 1999 edition that currently has a temperature fluctuation of 30 degrees between the first and second floor. So another systemic renovation the day it opens. So please do the right thing for Delaney High School the first time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Hagen. Good evening. Good evening. Members of the Board of Education, I come tonight as a representative of Perry Hall Middle School PTSA. I'm the PTSA president. I know you've heard a lot from our community the last few weeks. Even tonight, you've heard a lot from our community. And I expect you will hear a lot more in the weeks and months to come. All school year, our PTSA has heard from middle school parents concerned about the overcrowding at our school. They worry about class size, student safety, packed buses, and what the future will bring. They are now joined by parents of elementary school students, their grandparents, and concerned residents, many of whom have reached out to the PTSA. Some who had children in the school a decade ago are bewildered at how this problem is still going on, pointing out that it was predicted when their children were students. They wonder how bad it will need to get before it gets better. That's the message I'm sure you're hearing. It's the question we are so often asked. We know a new school is planned to address the overcrowding problem at area elementary schools, and that earlier this month you promised to take initial steps to deal with middle and high school overcrowding across the county. Our concern is how fast you do so. We know there is not an unlimited amount of money and that tough choices are often made as recommendations climb the ladder of authority. We want to make sure our area's concerns about the middle school are a top priority and are not put on the back burner when our numbers so clearly indicate the middle school needs attention. 
This school year, school year, Perry Hall Middle School opened at 110% of building capacity and with a student population of 1,860. In 2018, the school is projected to be at 126% of capacity and have 2,075 students. That's 215 more students than we had at the start of this school year, and a number much higher than, the, than what was projected even a year ago. Perry Hall Middle School is stretched. It is impractical to expect it to stretch much more. Simply stated, there is no place to go with the extra students. There are no lockers left, no extra classrooms. Even the best administrators and teachers have to be challenged by a population eruption of this size and must wonder what happens in the years to follow. We know it is impossible to implement a solution overnight. It is for this reason I urge you to talk to parents and think outside the box about how to solve the problem at our school in a timely and productive manner. I can tell you with certainty that parents, grandparents, and community members are motivated to help you find short and long-term solutions that benefit the students and the teachers that promote learning, safety, and academic success. Please prioritize a solution to the overcrowding problem at Perry Hall Middle School before the problem grows larger. Thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is F, and it is uh, personnel matters, and I invite uh, Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis. Good evening. Vice Chairwoman. Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Flight board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and ethics review panel appointment. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 through F3? So moved. Uh, I don't think we need a second, but we'll ask for a second. Second? Second. All right, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Mr. Gillis, I'll be abstaining. Please reflect that Ms. Causey abstained. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Uh, next on our item is, uh, next on our agenda is item G, um, and that is actions taken in closed session. I invite Mr. <coughs> Nussbaum to come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your uh, quasi-judicial capacity. That matter was considered on the record as there was no request for oral argument made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in that case in closed session, which was uh, hearing examiner number 17-28. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. You and the order's on the desk for Very good. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Uh, item H on our agenda is new business contract awards, and for that I ask our Building and Contracts Committee Chair, Mr. McDaniels, to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met this evening. Items H1 and H2 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items H1 and H2? So moved. There's a, a motion made, no, no second required. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 The uh, contract matters H1 and H2 uh, are approved. Item I on our agenda is board member comments, and I ask uh, Mrs. Eaton to begin. Thank you. Last Friday, I attended Edgemere Elementary School Black History Month read-in, where I had the opportunity to read to a fifth grade class a book entitled Sit-In. I want to publicly thank Edgemere Elementary and their principal, Ms. Lynch, for inviting me to be their guest. Too often, people talk about all the negative aspects of our school system. Well, I would like to give you an example of something positive that is taking place at Edgemere Elementary School. Edgemere is an excellent example of what all our public schools should look like. The students are actively engaged in the learning process. There are many student-led activities taking place. One example is where the third, fourth, and fifth graders are researching the Sparrows Point Edgemere area history. 
they will be creating a pictorial timeline and interviewing community members for firsthand accounts of places, events, and daily life on the North Point Peninsula. Their goal is to preserve memories for future generations. If anyone out there has some information to contribute, please contact the school. Another neat project is the fifth grade water seer fundraiser. Here the students hope to be able to provide clean water to some of the 2.3 billion people throughout the world who do not have clean drinking water. They are raising money and donating it to have water seers built in parts of the world that need it the most. I'm going to read something from their flyer. While learning about the water cycle in the science unit on weather, we discover a new invention called water seer that collects water vapors from the air and condenses it into clean, drinkable water using no electricity. So they are taking what they learn in the classroom and putting it to real world use. Not only are the students learning science, they are learning how to be caring people and stewards to our world. Thank you, Edgemere students, teachers, and Ms. Lynch. Keep up the excellent work. Thank you, Ms. Eden. Mrs. Williams. Yes, I was able to um, share and form a board member, George Moniotis' homegoing viewing and spend time with his family and they just continue to express how grateful they are to the board and the role um, the board played in his life. And I was uh, very grateful that I could do that. And I just also want to remind the public that PRC's uh, next meeting is March 13th. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. I just want to say, as the board member representing the 3rd District, which includes Delaney High School, I fully support the ongoing concerns of Delaney High School and the community, because it is not only the students and the parents and the teachers that are affected, but it's also the community all around the school uh, that has to deal with uh, the site as it is uh, that has not been um, updated. The proposed renovation in my opinion, because of uh, what I've heard from the Delaney community, is not sufficient nor a wise use of taxpayers' funds to provide a safe or a 21st century learning environment. Delaney's limited renovation does not adequately address all the needs and will be a waste of taxpayer money when down the road additional major work will remain, as was pointed out by Ms. Yar Sheikh. And I'm not alone in my concerns. Uh, I was sent a letter uh, dated January 13th, 2017, sent to the board, uh, signed by Senator James Brochin, Delegate Sue Allman, Delegate Chris West, Senator Bobby Zirkin, Delegate Shelley Heldman, Delegate Dan Morheim, and Delegate Dana Stein, who all are um, imploring us to uh, consider rebuilding rather than merely renovating Delaney High School. And I hope that the uh, county, the county executive, um, and my fellow board members would consider that. Uh, the board voted at the uh, budget meeting to do a countywide review of secondary schools' growth and overcrowding and what plans need to be developed to address them. As we've heard from Perry Hall Middle School, they had an addition, but it was insufficient. I'll be voting against it, so it's illogical to move forward with limited renovations for schools that either are or will be overcrowded, but have not even had a conversation of what to do about it. Uh, it was asked of our uh, engineers when we had a Delaney um, schematics discussion that they did not discuss future overcrowding because it was <coughs> not within the scope of the project. So, to, so for anyone to suggest that this board or this system has uh, evaluated rebuilding versus renovation, that evaluation has not been done. Um, if it's been done, it certainly has not been shared with the board. Um, I will be voting against any contract that comes before the board for a limited renovation to Delaney that does not fully address all of its current needs and its projected overcrowding. And I encourage other board members who have high schools in similar situations to evaluate the school in their district and advise board members of their opinion. I would also like to say that we are still hearing from Miss um, Baton uh, talked about it, grading and reporting. We're still hearing issues. And I was going to ask, what is the status? Can we get an update uh, next week when we have curriculum, uh, when we have committee updates? Uh, I am concerned when Ms. Baton talks about they're going to have changes next year. 
what is happening this year to our students, especially our high school students. We need to have more um, information about that. Uh, the other thing is Johns Hopkins University did their evaluation, which was talked about by PTA County Council, and I would like to have that agenda item added to a board meeting where we can discuss that as a board in an open meeting. Also, I'd like to um, just mention a bit about transportation that was also alluded to. I attended a Cedarmere PTA meeting that was held at 9 o'clock in the morning, and over uh, 25 parents missed work to come and express all of their concerns. Um, so hopefully uh, citizens that are concerned about where we're spending the money and the um, amendment that was made to the budget to add a million dollars to transportation, um, they need to understand that the budget right now is in front of the county council, and citizens should go and inform the members of the council uh, and the county executive of what issues are most important to them. Counselors, social workers, transportation, special ed, healthy climates, uh, both physical and emotional climates, uh, behavior issues, bullying, and what we can do to support our teachers. Um, also, I had asked to uh, have board the board evaluate Blueprint 2.0, and it was suggested that uh, among the board that we wait until the new elected board is here after 2018. But it has not been comprehensively evaluated since I've been on the board. How fair is it for students, parents, teachers, and taxpayers to wait that long? Next year's budget, if as planned by the superintendent and staff, will add digital devices to all high schools in all four grades, and then we will be locked into $50 million of leases ongoing per year. In our, uh, if we choose to evaluate Blueprint 2.0, which I will be bringing a motion at the next meeting or the meeting after that, we should also take time to reevaluate the device that we're using. I'm not against technology. I believe in technology appropriately applied. But when we are spending so much money on a device for elementary school children, uh, which diverts funds from all of these other areas, um, I think we need to reevaluate it. We could uh, have the elementary school children have a three-to-one ratio and a lower-priced device, for instance, $200 device, and send those more expensive laptops up to the high schools. Technology changes all the time, and usually what happens is you get more technology for a lower price as time goes by. So for us to continue to lease or purchase devices that were priced out four years ago is, is negligent, in my opinion. Also, uh, for parents that are concerned about digital safety, there's legislation in session right now, House Bill 866, that they can look up and address if they choose. Um, also, I would like to see us be more responsive as a board, and uh, folks can email me specifically their ideas, and hopefully we can do that uh, bringing up. Also, at the Policy Review Committee um, meeting last week, we discussed the disruptive behavior policy number 5550. So parents that are concerned about behaviors can look for that to come up for first reader, and then they can uh, send their comments to us. Also, as part of Blueprint 2.0, I would want us to evaluate our graduation rates. They're going up. Uh, but what does it mean when the graduations are, gro are going up when we still have considerable number of students graduating on bridge plans and with very low GPAs? We need to really evaluate the education that our children are receiving and how well they are being prepared for colleges and careers. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Mrs. Cosby. Mr. Yulefelder. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate Dr. Dance uh, on two awards uh, that he's received since our last meeting. The first is the uh, Lewis S. Diggs Award uh, bestowed upon uh, African American community and three recipients, and Dr. Dance, along with uh, Dr. Hrabowski and um, President Pro Tem of uh, Adrian um, Jones have uh, been awarded uh, their awards for this year. Also, uh, Dr. Dance was named the 2017 Maryland Outstanding Leader Using Technology by the Maryland Society for Educational Technology. Um, this is, these two are about two of four awards that Dr. Dance has uh, been awarded since October. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Yulefelder. Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so we did have the Johns Hopkins um, review from STAT, and so I was I spoke with one of my favorite STAT teachers, uh, Miss Jessica Wharton from Church Lane Elementary. 
um, and Churchland is an original lighthouse school. And she said a couple years ago, what was most exciting about STAT was watching the students um, embrace the technology, learn, t sometimes teach the teachers, um, the individualized learning, and um, having two kids in elementary school, I, I completely agreed with her. And now what she says most exciting is seeing the different leaders that have emerged in the schoolhouse, specifically the staff and, and the teachers. Um, she said, Ms. Ms. Wharton told me that there's one particular teacher, a 10-year veteran teacher, um, and I, I was made sure it was okay that I use her name, Ms. Valerie Pollard, who was not initially, um, re she wasn't resistant about learning the le new technology. She was just more overwhelmed and unsure, like many teachers probably were at the onset of, of STAT. And now, Ms. Wharton, the STAT teacher, goes into Ms. Pollard's room and sees Ms. Pollard using uh, different teaching strategies, melding two t techniques together, individualizing um, and utilizing all the technology to its fullest potential for her fifth grade students. In addition um, to what success Ms. Pollard has, has had, Ms. Wharton has also started increasing increased collaboration between all teachers throughout the school the schoolhouse. So a second grade teacher might create a tile and share that with a fourth or fifth grade teacher. Um, and so all of the teachers are now uh, learning the technology and, and benefiting their, their students. So Ms. Wharton spotlight, spotlights these things by creating a, what does she call it, tech, uh, tech tips newsletter. Um, at, she spotlight, spotlights these teachers at the staff meetings and then throughout the county in professional development. And actually the tech tips newsletter, some of the students contribute articles for those as well. So I'm, I'm really, ple I'm pleased to see uh, that the improved school culture, improved in networking and empowerment of our teachers because, I mean, the, our teachers do um, the most important job, I think, in, in the schoolhouse. And so I thank them for, for educating all of our, our future graduates. I'm also encouraged to see that JHU has suggested that we narrow the STAT teacher position expectations with a focus on instructional leadership because I think that's important for our STAT teachers to, ha to, to have a, a distinct uh, job description at each school. Lastly, I visited Deer Park Middle um, the morning after the last board meeting. So parents, we heard you. Um, I also know that Chuck contacted the administration um, in advance and did a school visit as well. I was reminded that the school has had four different leaders in five years. So it's important that we continue our support of the leadership at that school and we, work, we continue to work with the community to address their concerns for the, for over the change in leadership and reinforcing some of the discipline issues or, dis, or changing some of the discipline issues that we have there at the school. So I look forward to working with Ms. Taylor and the PTA in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next is our superstar student member of the board, Ms. Brad. Um, nothing for me tonight, but I am very excited by the time. We made a good time. <laughs> Sorry. I'm very excited Mr. Birch. Uh, Allison, don't ever change. The, 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 the fact is we were making good time. I don't know if we will continue. Um, first, uh, uh, I want to thank everybody from Perry Hall that, that came to tonight's meeting, and we are going to, I am going to talk quick. Um, the folks from Perry Hall really uh, ha have made the case more than once, continue to make it, and they do it very, very diligently. And uh, Julie and I hear you, uh, the other board members can speak for themselves, certainly. And uh, Julie and I aren't done, and we have more work to do working with you for good outcomes. Um, secondly, I was at the Crossroads School. Uh, I was there with, when engineers were, were there uh, last week. And these engineers from the county, uh, different county firms had volunteered their time to come and uh, do whatever they specialize in, uh, whether it be uh, bioengineering, and that meant students uh, bashing up uh, strawberries and extracting that DNA to then uh, kind of like uh, uh, chart it, uh, or whether it was uh, using other kind of materials to build some kind of uh, rigid uh, structure to hold a certain weight. Uh, it was great to see these engineers who love what they do give back to students that really were having fun interacting with them and also asking them how much money they make as engineers. <laughs> um, and the Crossroads School is always a good school, and I, I thank Jay Ward for uh, taking the time to show me around. On another occasion, I'll share with the board members uh, one of the student presentations I was able to listen to. Uh, it was actually pretty fascinating. It was uh, a, a presentation about the comparison of education and poverty in the Baltimore region. And I'm happy to share that with you all because I think it was very, very timely. 
Um, secondly, I went to a college day at <coughs> Pine Grove Middle School, and uh, uh, Tina Nelson, Nelson uh, was really a great host, as were the rest of the staff, but also uh, I had a personal tour of the school from the second vice president of the Baltimore County <coughs> Student Council. Uh, you may uh, have met him when he was here, Carter um, uh, Bohart. Uh, and Carter has grown since he was last here, not, not a month or two ago. <laughs> and uh, he showed me uh, areas in the school, and we talked about some possible solutions. Uh, Carter really, uh, he, is, he projects a, a, a seriousness beyond his age. And the students at our Pine Grove Middle School really are really good students. For their college day presentations, uh, they had set up these stations and uh, it was about their favorite college that they would like to attend or university they'd like to attend. And the staff jumped in because uh, our teachers were wearing their own kind of colors and they had decorated their own boards and they were very, or their own doors uh, through the classrooms. And uh, my alma mater's uh, Towson University, of course it was called something else when I went there, and uh, the University of Baltimore that were also. Oh, the normal school. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, it was a very, very good experience, and if any of the board members have an opportunity to visit our Pine Grove Middle School, it, it is a very good, rewarding thing, to, uh, good, good thing to do. Lastly, tomorrow night is the Victory Villa Elementary Boundary Study. It's another meeting of that, and uh, because I was uh, at the, the interviews for our uh, um, uh, applicant for the uh, ethics uh, review panel. I wasn't able to go to the last meeting, but of course I will be at the meeting tomorrow. And that's at Little River Middle School, and it starts at 6 o'clock. Because as many of you know, we're going to have a new Victoryville Elementary School, and it's going to have 700 kids. So anyway, so we'll get back on p pace to making good time. Go ahead, Chuck. <laughs> Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Um, I, I would just like to briefly express my appreciation to the parents and community that have come out from Perry Hall Middle School and then those that came out a couple weeks ago from uh, Deer Park Middle School and uh, along with the parents uh, thank our elected officials and very various community organizations that have embraced these issues um, and I think it's important that we could work collaboratively on something like that so we all feel needs improvement. And as was said this evening, it's time to uh, move the discussion towards solutions and actionable items so that we do see some improvement for our students in school. But again, it's important, somebody mentioned the squeaky wheel, but it is important to hear the voice of the parents. And it doesn't seem like the Perry Hall community needs more encouragement, but I'm, I hope that they will stay involved. And uh, again, we'll start shifting towards towards solutions and getting some action items to help uh, all of our middle school students that are at a critical point in their education. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Henn. Mr. Chair, I'd like to echo my board members' comments and thank the Perry Hall parents for coming out tonight um, for two weeks ago for the continued emails. Your engagement means a lot, um, and I'm very proud to be part of your community, so thank you. I'd um, like to call out one parent who spoke tonight in particular, Ms. Amy Mitcherling. Amy and I were actually classmates at Perry Hall Middle. I won't say how many years ago. <laughs> but we were those sixth graders being pushed and shoved in the same crowded hallways we hear about today. It's too funny. And it's both surreal and disappointing that 30 years later, and I am going to date us, Amy, I apologize. 30 years later, we're having the same conversations. The hallways are just as jam-packed. Kids are getting pushed and shoved. I've got Girl Scouts in my Girl Scout troop coming to me weekly saying they're, they're getting heads pushed into lockers. That's unacceptable. Um, we were all waiting with bated breath to see the new 2016 um, report of enrollments, maybe hoping for a mass exodus from Perry Hall. I'm not sure what we were hoping for, but that would certainly be an answer. Only to find that Perry Hall Middle is expecting to see 7% growth in each year over the next two years. And I'm gonna repeat the numbers. So capacity is 1,600. We're expecting 2,000 and 2,100 by 2019. 2,075 kids in the 2018-2019 school year. 400 over capacity. As a board, if we were considering relocating an elementary school with 400 kids into an existing middle school at capacity, we would find it preposterous. There is no way that would be acceptable. And yet, this is acceptable for Perry Hall Middle. Policy 5140 states that we're responsible um, for establishing geographic attendance areas for our students to avoid overutilization of some schools and underutilization of others. 
clearly something is not working. As a board, we need to look at that policy. We need to figure out what is not working, and we need to do so immediately, not only for Perry Hall, but for other schools in this um, situation. I'm deeply concerned about Ridgely Middle, as well as Towson High, in addition to Perry Hall. They need short-term and long-term solutions, and we can't wait any longer. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank the entire board for uh, its continuing efforts, uh, for its uh, continuing uh, striving to uh, collaborate and cooperate, uh, because with uh, teamwork, uh, we're sure to achieve success. Um, the uh, item J on our agenda is information that is at your places. You'll see there's materials regarding the 2018 um, board proposed budget. You'll also see at your place is the Student Counts 2016 publication on the annual report on enrollment and school utilization, and further uh, financial report for uh, uh, the months ending December 15 and 16. Our next board meeting is Tuesday, March 7, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, right here. We're adjourned.